Dear colleague, welcome to this uh, session sponsored by, by Shockwave Medical and entitled Cracking New Horizon Across All Calcium Morphologies. So my name is, is Thomas Cuisset. I'm working in, uh, in France, in Marseille. And just to, to present the team with whom you we will discuss uh, case injuries during this 45 minute session, I'm very happy to co-chair this session with uh, James Pratt, and we had uh, two speakers, Khaled Al Shaibi and Hawaid Al, Al Shamari. As you will see, they will present very, very challenging case, highlighting the importance of IVL in treatment of, of calcified lesion. So the learning objective we'll try to achieve together during these 45 minutes will be first to understand mechanism of action of IVL for treatment of calcified lesion then to uncover practical tips and techniques for IVL in challenging calcified lesion and how to learn safely how to use IVL in left main uh, bifurcation. And to achieve that, here is the, the agenda of the session and the uh, implementation of the, of the team. So we'll start by a, a lecture and a case from uh, James about the fundamental of IVL and the mechanism of action in, in lung diffuse disease. Then Khaled Al Shaibi, as you will see, will share a very uh, challenging case of uh, resistant calcified lesion. And then Dr. Al Shaberi will focus on the, on the specific anatomical subset of the left main calcified bifurcations and to see how we can safely use IVL. So without further introduction, it's my pleasure to, to welcome the first uh, speaker, James, who will present the, the first talk. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, pleasure to be back in Dubai and speak to you about lithotripsy. I think in the last 10 years of coronary, there's been very few properly disruptive changes in that most of it seems like the same old thing again and again and again. But IVL really is different. It really is disruptive technology, and I'm going to explain to you today why you should adopt it in your practice. So what is the problem of eccentric calcium, and how common is it? Well, if we look at the pooled analysis from disrupt series of studies, we can see that this is a pre-selected group with severe calcium, that in about half the cases there was eccentric calcium. So in your cases, it's the commonest morphology that you'll find. You'll also find other concentric nodular calcium, et cetera. But eccentric calcium is really easy to find and up to now, very difficult to treat. So what are the challenges in eccentric calcium? Well, what we want to do is convert calcium into nice little fractures so that we can expand our stent safely and not risk problems with incomplete stent expansion or even worse, vessel per perforation. And up to now, we've had very little ways of doing that. We've got balloon-based therapies, and we think, OK, we can expand the balloon. But unfortunately, the balloon has only got one way of treating plaque, and that's concentric force. So if you apply concentric force to an eccentric load, what happens is the balloon expands away from the calcium and expands into the adventitia. And if you keep on expanding that, there's a limit and you can get perforations. What more frequently you get is tears at the junction between the calcium and the fibrotic tissue. So if you use this analogy, you can see a little group of friends on the left holding hands with a big ball in the middle. Don't ask why they got there. This is just an analogy. And on the right, you've got, again, only three friends. When you expand that calcium concentrically, you fracture in a concentric way, whereas with the eccentric calcium, the force of the balloon is away from the resistance. So actually, it makes more sense to use high-pressure balloons and concentric calcium. In eccentric calcium, there is no mechanism for their, for their use, and they actually risk safety to your patient and your procedure. And you might say, well, let's just use atherectomy, whether it's in the form of rotational atherectomy or orbital atherectomy. And here, atherectomy critically is a contact-dependent technology. And that very simply means it's got to touch the calcium to modify the calcium. And that's great if you've got wire bias that's favorable and you touch the calcium. But there are two main limitations. Firstly, it's very difficult to control where the wire goes down a calcific artery. 
And secondly, that in terms of ablation, you get much less volume reduction than you might think. So people think, well, okay, I'm just going to drill away all the calcium. And actually, the data shows us that well, actually we drill away about 10% of the calcium. So it probably has a utility in volume reduction, but that utility is less profound than we might think. So how can IVL provide a solution? Well, the first thing to say is it's very, very different therapy. The balloon is just a delivery mechanism. It works by an acoustic waveform, and this acoustic waveform has very profound effects that are very different within coronary calcium to anything else out there. And you can see that waveform travels from inwards to outwards, and of course the pulses depend on how many you deliver that section, but there are three characteristic forces that are produced. The first force is analogous to balloon-based therapy, and that's compressive force. You get this compressive force. The second is shear stress that expand the calcium and tell you why you need to apply more pulses to the right area. And then the final force reflected back from the wave from the leading edge of the calcium is tensile force. So you get this very different appearance in the coronary calcium to balloon-based therapies where you get this kind of crazy paving effect. What we're trying to do is fracture the calcium to reduce the volume. Again, an analogy would be stones in a jar. You have big stones in a jar, you say the jar is full. Let's add some pebbles. And the pebbles take up less volume than the big stones. And that's exactly what happens when we fracture the calcium into sufficiently small pieces. We're then able to expand the stent and the, the pieces, individual pieces, have much influ less influence on vascular calcium. And critically, with the development of therapies and with the application of more pulses within a single balloon, we can now treat these areas of eccentric calcium, which perhaps aren't as flow-limiting as the concentric calcium or the nodular calcium, but which still restricts stent expansion. And this is a critical side for you to appreciate, that the, this is the high-res CT of balloon versus lithotripsy, that the mechanism of action is distinctly different and it results in a very different modification, a much more profound modification of calcium than you see with any other therapies, the so-called so crazy paving effect. And if we compare it to other therapies, well, first of all, we're not using barotrauma here, so we're not, we don't have to go to 50 atmospheres to crack the calcium. In fact, the optimum inflation pressure is between two and four atmospheres, and it selectively targets calcium. And of course, for eccentric calcium, that's absolutely critical. If you've got a whole ring of fibrotic tissue and an arc of calcium, you want your therapy to be targeting the calcium, and you want it to be targeting the deep wall calcium and to be independent of wire bias and lumen size. And we see that from the data, that if we look within, again, the pool set of data, that in terms of arc of calcium, there doesn't seem to be any differential effect. You get the same stent area, and you get the same stent expansion, irrespective of whether it's eccentric or concentric. So let's look at this within a live case example. So you've got an elderly gentleman who presented with acute coronary syndrome. He's got, by any metric, horrible coronary disease, uh, previously medically managed, and you can see that he's got a CTO of his right coronary artery. From the caudal view, we can see that there's an osteal disease, there's significant distal disease, and the vessel is very tortuous. And that tortuosity might make you a little bit nervous about using rotational atherectomy. But let's look at it again from a cranial perspective. Again, a very long section of disease. With the previous iteration of the lithotripsy balloon, you might be a little bit concerned about have you got enough pulses to modify the calcium? Because as you can see, and as I referred to earlier, there's mixed morphology, eccentric, concentric, and nodular calcium. So how do we treat that? First of all, we know it's going to be difficult to wire. You can see the complexity of this case, that they've used a, a microcaster and a polymeric wire. They put a safety wire critically in the circumflex, and of course you can't do that with rotational atherectomy. And they've used a microcaster to access the distal vessel. With the microcaster in place, that makes it pretty simple to access. 
Now, one of the limitations of lithotripsy is delivery. It's not terrible, but at the same time, compared to standard balloons, which don't have that acoustic waveform, it's a little bit more difficult to deliver. And the, the, the main mechanism to negotiate that is to use guide extensions. And of course, the best way to deliver guide extensions is with balloon-based therapy, so they track around the wire rather than go into the wall of the vessel and use this so-called inchworming technique. Now, here's a very important image from the initial balloon therapy. You can see that dog boning, but critically, you can also see there's wire bias on either side of the balloon. And wire bias is what you can tell from the angiogram where the eccentric force is being applied. So if you think back to the original schematic, the balloon is expanding away from the calcium, therefore the wall is against the calcium. And then you, you, most times when you're treating coronary calcium, the best way to understand it is with intravascular imaging. And of course you can use OCT or you can use IVIS depending on your preference. But it's really important to understand what you're dealing with here. So if we look at the IVIS, you can see speed it up, pulled back. Everybody's relieved by that. You can see, first of all, there's nodular calcium at the top of the vessel. This is pretty typical. Now you've got eccentric or calcific nodule to, to the right of the vessel. Again, a very long section of, of eccentric disease. There's the bifurcation with the diagonal branch. A little bit more eccentric calcium with a small tear where the bloom is inserted. And again, very eccentric with a little bit of concentric calcium uh, near the ostium of the LED. More eccentric calcium. And as we come back towards the left main, you can see this pattern of eccentric disease continues right up to the left main, which is relatively free of disease. So to facilitate further delivery of the balloon, we've used 2.5. Again, there's got this critical wire bias. If you look very carefully at that wire, you can see it's at the upper surface of the vessel. That means the balloon is expanding away from the calcium to the lower surface of the vessel. Now, if you want to get that balloon to a bigger size and you don't use lithotripsy, the only way you can get that larger volume is to expand into the adventitia. And of course, the adventitia is only so forgiving. If you keep expanding, then you're going to get a problem. So again, we've used this guide extension inchwormed into the LED. You can see the balloon is expanded to center the guide extension. And then the balloon is, uh, the guide extension is then delivered into the proximal LED. Now at this stage, you've got a very easy mechanism to deliver the IVL balloon, which we can deliver to the distal lesion very easily. And remember, this isn't a balloon, this is a way of delivering an acoustic waveform. We expand that, we deliver how many pulses that we think that the, the intravascular imaging uh, applies with. And again, you get that same mechanism of therapy, the, the the three key forces, the compressive force, the shear force, and the tensile forces, so you fracture the calcium. And that's irrespective of whether it's eccentric, nodular, or concentric. And we do the same in the proximal vessel. Because we've got 120 pulses, we can do that from distal to proximal and not worry about running out of therapy. Always remember the osteal LED is also very, very critical to treat if we're going to get a good stent result. And let's have a look at the, the IVUS. So again, what we're looking for is fractures in the IVUS. Fractures you can see because there's penetration of ultrasound beyond the dense calcium. And it should start for us here. So there's fractures there at 3 o'clock. Fractures again at 6 o'clock in very eccentric calcium. Proximal part of the, 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 the artery looks a little better. There's multiple fractures, and you can see them moving apart here, top and bottom of the artery. A lot of fractures in the proximal vessel. And then back into left main with more fractures and very eccentric calcium. And that last still is a really good um, explanation of how IVL works. You've got a very clean vessel at the bottom and a very calcified vessel at the top. The balloon is going to expand away from the calcium. IVL is going to target it. 
So now we know the fractures are in place, and if we put a stent in, that the vascular compliance is sufficiently low that we can expand the stent concentrically. And even more importantly than that, because we've changed the compliance of the vessel, it's very easy to deliver what is essentially a rigid structure, that of the stent. So we place a couple of stents in place, proximal and distal. There's, of course, a size discordance with this vessel being treated over such a long length. So we have to ensure we do that properly. So a proximal optimization in the left main, the 5.5 balloon. Again, I was guided. And then we expand the stent throughout its length, the 4.0 balloon and a 3.5 balloon distally. And then critically, at the end of the procedure, we want to check we've got good stent expansion, that the stent has been implanted and it hasn't traumatized the vessel, and then we've got a number, an area, that's going to give this patient a good durable result. And you can see osteum of the LED is nearly 12 millimeters squared, so a great result. And angiographically, a good result in the very diseased distal vessel, with an excellent result in the left main. So what did we learn from this? Well, firstly, that we don't really have a good therapy up to now in eccentric calcium. It's a real challenge to treat with balloon-based therapies. When we expand the balloon, remember it's expanding away from the calcium and there's only so much space for that to happen. That there's a unique mechanism of action with these three compressive tensile and shear stresses, which you don't get with any other therapy. And with high-grade disease, you can optimize the use of IVL with guide extension therapies. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, James. I think it's very convincing. Uh, and on top on, uh, on the lecture, I would like maybe not to congratulate because I'm always amazed by the quality of the visual, which is, I know, based on the Optima principle, and it's absolutely outstanding. So thank you. Uh, do you have a, a question or comment? Yes, Mohamed. <coughs> James, thank you. This is a beautiful case, as usual. Um, when you have the chance of orbital etherectomy and shockwave, we are heavily using now shockwave in our area, to be honest with you. And even in a good number of cases, we started with rotoplation, but they were not satisfied very well than I do a shockwave, like two steps of, uh, but in comparison with orbital etherectomy, which Legion, you will use this, and which legion you will use that? Yeah, great question. I, I think there's a very easy way to answer that. Remember that orbital and rotational atherectomy are both ablative technologies. So if the wire is against the calcium, they'll ablate it. There are probably two misconceptions with both technologies. Firstly, that they reduce the volume of the calcium a lot. They don't, they reduce it a bit, by about 10 to 15%. Secondly, that the arc of orbital differentiates from rotational atherectomy. And the arc of orbital is about 1.8 millimeters. So in large vessels, that's not sufficient to modify the calcium. And critically different from rotational atherectomy and IVL is that IVL isn't, isn't dependent on wire bias. So if you do your imaging run and you see the wire is nowhere near the calcium, then the road is not going to work. And that also explains why rota and orbital are of most value where you have problems crossing the lesion. Because when your problem's crossing the lesion, it's always in contact with the wire, and therefore it'll always modify the lesion. So I think the best use of orbital and rotational atherectomy is to facilitate IVL therapy if subsequently required, because it won't modify deep wall calcium. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, just one question about the nominal pressure. Would you recommend any time you go above or beyond the uh, nominal pressure? I had it once. There was a small perf from just going a very, probably was four or even six um, atmosphere on the... Uh, yeah, I, I, again, a, a really important question. So remember that the acoustic waveform is contact dependent. That's why preparation of the balloon is really important, that it's fluid filled. That enables the acoustic waveform to travel from the balloon out into the vessel. If the balloon is undersized, so there's a gap between the balloon and the wall, you'll get some dissipation of effect. So the most important thing is that it's contact dependent and therefore the pressure is not that important. And actually somewhere between two and four is, is plenty. And there is an argument to say that two is better than four. 
Now, there used to be, we used to say, after you deliver IBL, then expand the balloon to six. Now, that actually doesn't make any sense at all. If you want to understand the effects, then use subsequently imaging to have a look for fractures, or use a balloon as a secondary therapy. But in terms of delivering therapy, make sure the balloon is sized to the vessel, and then the, the inflation pressures don't matter beyond that. Yeah, it's a very short question. I, 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 uh, I see that we could discuss hours with James, and you want to do so, me as well. But after we have to move, so very short question and short answer, Dr. please. Dr. Bedel Zarani from Prince Sultan Cardiac Center. When you did that uh, shockwave lithotripsy multiple times in that vessel, and you did the repeated imaging uh, IVUS, would you feel comfortable just deploying the stent after that, or you would do uh, to check the compliance of the vessel with an NC? I, again, another great question. I'll try and keep the the answer short. So we, the, at the moment, what we use to understand vessel compliance is anatomy, and anatomy has its limitations. So we look at the, we look at it in imaging. We say there are fractures, therefore the compliance must be restored. There is no problem putting an intermediate step by using a balloon inflation, like an NC balloon, and using that to ensure that it's concentrically expanded. Again, looking at wire bias. It's not always necessary, but there are some situations in about a third of cases where we don't see fractures, but we still get stent expansion. So it's a, it's a reasonable step to do before you put the stent in. Thank you, James. I'm sorry, it's a bit frustrating. We would like to discuss extensively, but now we'll move to Khaled El Shaibi. And uh, Dr. Balgit already <coughs> mentioned the use of combination of different dedicated devices, and I think Khaled will nicely highlight that in the challenging case. Okay, great. Um, so this is a case of refractory calcium. I think it's going to highlight several of the points Dr. Spratt pointed out in his very elegant presentation. Mine is not quite as elegant. So I have no conflicts of interest here. And first of all, I, the case I'm going to present is a case that really changed the way I practice when dealing with calcium. And to understand the way I used to practice, you need to understand I trained back in the U.S. In, uh, between 1993 and 1996 with Gary Rubin at the University of Alabama. And there, we did not have intracoronary imaging. And whenever we saw calcium, it immediately meant to us rotational atherectomy. And that's how I trained and practiced for many, many years. But what did we have back in the 1990s when I was training? All we had was rotational atherectomy and laser, which was not very effective in the treatment of calcium. So that's where my biases come from. Obviously, now in 2023, we have many more uh, plaque modification tools available to us from modified balloons to uh, orbital atherectomy, and obviously, we're all here to hear about shockwave lithotripsy. So this is the case. A 48-year-old man with hypertension, end-stage renal disease on dialysis for two years, with about a year's history of exertional chest pains, class 2 to 3, who had a MyView scan which was strongly positive, indicative of inferior ischemia. This, this, this workup was done at another hospital. He underwent a diagnostic angiogram, and they found and occluded heavily calcified, as you can see from the fluoroscopy here on the right, a heavily calcified occluded dominant right coronary artery. They proceeded with PCI, and if you look carefully, you can see both with the use of a 3-ONC balloon at high atmospheres and a cutting balloon at higher atmospheres that I would normally use, a persistent waste on the balloon indicated non-expansion. So rightly so, they actually stopped. They, they, did, they did not stent. Uh, they did a final angiogram. Uh, the vessel was secluded. Now it's patent, but obviously this is a uh, suboptimal result. And they referred the patient uh, to us. He made it to us about two months later. Uh, I'm not sure why the delay, but uh, we got him about two months later, and this was the angiogram. The vessel was still patent, uh, still calcified, and obviously, as expected, uh, a severe restenosis. So obviously I was trained with rotational atherectomy. We had orbital atherectomy uh, relatively uh, new in our hospital, so I decided to go with orbital atherectomy. I remember, I'm still biased. I'm not a strong believer in imaging at this point. So I proceeded with orbital atherectomy. And I did several runs, both at 80,000 and 120,000 RPMs. 
then I obviously got out my balloon again to see if I'd adequately uh, modified the calcium. I was expanding my NC balloons, but again, with an NC balloon at high atmospheres and with a cutting balloon, I still had a persistent waste again, so I felt uncomfortable proceeding with stenting at this point. I said, well, okay, orbital atherectomy doesn't work. Let me get out my true and tested and faithful rotablator. I upsized to an eight French guiding system and used a two millimeter burr. And again, multiple runs uh, with a two millimeter burr at 180,000 RPM, crossed the, uh, the plaque several times, uh, polishing runs, everything was done correctly. And then I said, well, I'm, I'm sure now I'll, I'll be in great shape. Same thing. I go up with a 3ONC balloon. I still have a persistent waste on the balloon. And uh, I said, well, I'm not going to put a stent here now. I had, have an inadequately expanded stent and have this patient come back to me in a few weeks' time with a stent thrombosis. I observed the uh, result for several minutes, took a final angiogram. No dissections, good flow. I decided to leave it at this point. I knew we were getting IVL within the next several months. I wasn't exactly sure when, but we, w we were expecting expecting to get it. So six months later, we have coronary lithotripsy. I bring the patient back. And uh, again, uh, as expected, uh, we've got restenosis. That's nothing unusual. I pass the lith a 3.5 lithotripsy balloon here, and I deliver uh, over the entire calcified segment a total of 80 pulses. We don't have the 120 pulses. We still have the, uh, the catheters that only deliver 80 pulses. Uh, I, I can't wait to get the 120. After that, I do a balloon dilatation, and I do get very good balloon expansion. I therefore proceed with stenting using uh, uh, tandem stenting with two 3.5 drug eluting stents. A final dilatation with a 3.5 NC balloon at high pressure, and this is the final angiogram. And really, this, this, this case changed the way I view calcium. Not all calcium is going to respond to rotational or orbital atherectomy, and there is an importance of using imaging. Had I used imaging in the beginning, I'm sure now I'd have found a lot of deep calcium, and that would have probably explained the reason why I had a suboptimal uh, response to both orbital and rotational atherectomy. And if you look at so many of the guidelines or the algorithms they put out there for calcium modification, you'll find that lithotripsy balloon features features very prominently as almost the final common pathway, whether you start off with modifying balloons such as cutting balloons or NC balloons or orbital or rotational atherectomy. If you don't have optimal uh, balloon expansion after that, your final common pathway is, common, is, is uh, coronary lithotripsy. And I really think there may be a possible paradigm shift that we're approaching as far as approaching calcified lesions with this really disruptive new technology. And if you look at the NCDR registry in the US over the past five years and track the use of these types of therapies in, in pa all patients undergoing PCI, you'll find that over the past five years, the use of rotational atherectomy has remained relatively stable at around 2 to 3% uh, of patients that uh, undergo PCI will undergo rotational atherectomy. If you look at orbital atherectomy, again, over the past five years, that has remained relatively stable at around 1.5%. Yet if you look at IVL over the past two years, you'll find a striking rise in the use of this, uh, the, the, uh, the adoption of this technology uh, for ca calcified lesions. And I see this only as growing as the crossing profile of these balloons becomes better, as they become cheaper, and they're able to deliver more pulses. So I really think we're on the horizon of a new era in the treatment of calcified lesions. Uh, obviously, as you saw in this case, uh, IVL can very frequently frequently be used to, uh, to uh, get good results in combination with other forms of therapy. When you can't cross, you prepare the way, as Dr. Spratt said, with an orbital or rotational or laser, and then follow that up with uh, a definitive treatment with lithotripsy. Thank you very much. It's a great case there. Um, so I think this is one of the cases that, as you say, changes your practice. You've, you throw all your old tools at it and you're still left with an issue. I guess, you know, people like yourself who are very skilled and adapted with ablation technologies, 
are going to follow that pathway. I would say that the bigger picture is that the penetration of IVIS is, what, 3%? And the penetration of calcium is a lot higher. What would you say in response to that? I didn't quite understand the question. So the question is that there are many more patients with calcium that are currently getting rotational atherectomy. So I think, you know, if you say without lithotripsy, a lot of patients are getting inadequately treated or not currently treated. It, do you think there's an option for lithotripsy to target those patients? And if so, what are the barriers to that? Well, I think absolutely. I mean, uh, I think the way this is going is that if you can deliver an IVL uh, balloon, uh, it's, in my opinion, the, the best way to go about treating calcium is going to treat superficial calcium, deep calcium, concentric calcium, eccentric calcium, all forms of calcium. The main impediment really is delivering these balloons. And very frequently, you can deliver them by pre-dilating with an NC balloon and creating a track to deliver the IVL balloon. But I really do think that it's going to become the dominant uh, form. And again, it's very, there is no learning curve, re hardly a learning curve, as opposed to rotational and orbital atherectomy, where really there, is, there can be a steep lean learning curve. If you can use a coronary balloon, you can use a lithotripsy balloon. So I really do think it's going to become the dominant treatment. And Halle, as you say, for this patient, finally had three procedures, you had to pay for rotational orbital. So uh, do you think that sometimes we try to make things simple and not use imaging upfront? And exactly as you say during your case, do you think the fact that we have new devices to treat calcified lesion means also that we have to look more carefully to the calcium to decide which is the good device for this specific patient? I don't want to be too controversial here. Imaging is important, and we've learned a lot from imaging, and we continue to learn a lot from imaging. But as you said, uh, not, not everybody has imaging available to them. Uh, and uh, even in those labs that do have imaging available, they should be encouraged to use it more. But again, the penetration is not that great. And for many people, I imagine here in the audience, may not have uh, imaging available to them. I think this type of therapy makes treatment of calcified lesions uh, for them much easier. Uh, I think that's why it's really going to become a, a dominant treatment modality. And I don't think we should be embarrassed about being easy. You know, uh, we absolutely, absolutely. You, you know, as I said, you've got to a stage in your practice where you're very skilled using all sorts of ablative technologies. But I'm sure you appreciate that there are plenty of your colleagues who are not at that stage. And if we're worried about democratizing treatment so that all patients get a good outcome, then the only way to do that is to make things more simple. I couldn't agree more. <clears throat> yeah. Good. Thank you. I think we can we can move to the to the next case, and Dr. Al Shamiri will uh, present uh, the use of IVL in calcified lesion, but in a specific subset of of left main disease. Okay. So I was asked to present the case where we did IVL in a left main. So in the last one year, I did that case. You, we avoid the in the clinical trials left main in the uh, among the population. That's why in the uh, uh, disrupt CAD trials, n left main was excluded, except in the the Japanese uh, one, the fourth. Um, uh, they included only one unprotected left main. Um, but I'll tell you in, in that uh, case uh, uh, whether we need to do it or not. So an 87-year-old gentleman admitted from ER with three-day history of increasing angina. He has past history of diabetes, hypertension, medical therapy. He's found to have non STEMI and underwent cardiac cath, showed distal left main and LED disease, uh, heart team discussion declined from surgery due to severe carotid artery disease. He has occluded right ICA and severe stenosis in the left ICA. That's the angiogram. And the, we booked him today at that day for left main intervention and LED. As you see, this kind of a, a pipe of calcium in the proximal LED and the distal LED, the distal LED has tandem of two lesions, and the left main is smaller than the two daughter branches. Um, 
So left mane is a different animal. It has different shapes. The, you can get the the main bezel. Uh, the this is 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 the LED. Sometimes the main bezel is the uh, the left circumflex, and and the the stenosis or the the calcium or the lesion at the upper roof or the the down floor. So the, the provisional stenting or we go bifurcation stenting. So in general, we understand we go uh, the provisional stenting as long as it is a symbol and the two stenting probably, probably if it is uh, complex. What's the data tell us that the when we do unprotected left main stenting versus cabbage, the, diff the main difference comes from the rate of revascularization during long term. It's not the MI, it's not the mortality in general. And there are two key factors, these the visual diameter and the lesion length, uh, but the bifurcation angle may not act as strong as the, the above two. So as I mentioned earlier, provisional or two stents, the, we have in mind the, the among the Excel trial um, cohort, 342 patients this the left main with involvement of one of the main branches. The three-year outcome, the primary outcome was lower in the provisional stenting versus two stents. However, among the 122 patients who had the involvement of two br main branches, there is no difference between provisional and, and the two stents. So we thought that the two stents is, yes, it is complex, but in the long term, probably we don't need it. But actually, the reverse if it's in symbol. In a symbol, the symbol lesion, the problem with the two stents has more worse outcomes. So the different classification available, Medina, that, uh, what we always do, but it lacks the classifications. But the syntax code, two scores, two complex, uh, the new risk stratification score is more complex, but the definition criteria is dedicated for the left main. And they, uh, they included the classification among this to differentiate this is symbol or this is complex. So in, in our patients, uh, the, 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 the left circumflex is spurred, so that, therefore it is symbol, therefore we should go for the, um, the provisional uh, stenting. What is important, the, should we do IVUS, should we do uh, the optima, optima, for, ca, ca, to see the calcium and, uh, and the, do the optimization? In, in that case, I'll go with IVUS for optimization only because I know there is a lot of calcification and we need to do the further preparation. Um, the shockwave, uh, it's available in the market since 2020, actually from November 2019 available, but, um, but uh, available in my lab in 2020. It's effective with high, very high procedural success and the MACE uh, outcomes in all the trials of disrupts are around 5%, which is pretty low. And here we wired the LED there was tortuosity, we, we put the, the Grand Slam to support, and I started with the, uh, because there's one, no balloons, or uh, no balloons crossing this angle, so we did the Rota 1.5, then 1.75, then the, uh, the NC balloon. Then in that area, because the, the, in the NC balloon was having a waste in the floor, so I need to crack it more with the shockwave 3.5, followed by IVUS. IVUS was not progressing until here. Then I did another shockwave, the 3.5 in the uh, proximal LED. Then we stented distally and post dilatation in the distal part and it cracked the calcium in the proximal part of the stents. Then provision stenting, as we discussed, use a 3.5, then post dilate with a 5.0 balloon in the uh, other pot. And actually, we also extended to that 
curved segment uh, further dilatation. And this final angle, the proximal LED is good, distal LED is good, no immediate complications, as well as the left main widely open. Conclusion, left main is a different animal, use all what we got. So to even the, the clinical, they did not involve the um, left main among the disrupt CAD trials, but as you see here, we use the rota, we use NC balloon, high pressure, was not tracking, uh, cracking it, but we stay as much as possible symbol because complex has a worse outcome, not similar outcome to provisional. And the IVAS preparation, make sure the preparation with NC balloon, shock wave, atherectomy devices, the and the, the going to symbol as much as possible. I, I usually uh, adapt the the, uh, the the definition criteria right now, but in the past just to see the side branch, which is the less circumflex, is it okay to leave it or uh, or to uh, tackle it? Thank you. It's a great case. Um, so. After that case, how have you adopted IVL into left main treatment? Because you've, you've shown us there's a lot of tools out there. <clears throat> I guess from the audience perspective, the difficult bit is when do you choose these tools? You've got all these options. What, what, makes, what drives your choices in left main? The, the amount of calcium in the left main. If it is too much calcification, I just go to the uh, IVL. But you mean if you can cross the, the calcified lesion, you will, in the left main, start by IVL? I mean, instead of uh, orbital rotational atherectomy? So for, for that case, I have also LAD and distal LAD. I don't want to do the IVL first, then go with the rota, then I will lacerate the vessel more. So just to minimize the, the paratrauma. What percentage of your cases are you using rota plus shockwave? Actually, quite a lot. So So... Among the patients who has calcified lesion that I cannot cross with IVL, I go rota. And, and I think that's you know very in line to what most algorithms say that if you don't understand the calcium and you can't, and which you know if you can't cross in it with an imaging catheter, you're not going to be able to understand it. But if you can't cross it, then th these ablative technologies are really good because of what we discussed earlier that there's no influence of wire bias. The wire is, by definition, covered in calcium, and therefore rotational atherectomy or orbital is a great way for accessing the vessel and starting to understand it. I think the difference is that previously, because that's all we had, then we just went to balloons and used bigger and bigger balloons. And now we're starting to understand that there are risks inherent in that and obviously limitations with that as well. So it's interesting to see you know, that data you presented earlier, whether that will hold out, whether Roto, I suspect, will start to perhaps increase again because people are starting to change how they yeah. use it. Rather than a one-stop therapy, it's a way of accessing secondary therapy. Yes, please, we have yeah. a question. <clears throat> in case of doing IVL for the left main stem, I are going to give 10 shocks or because we are going to occlude the left main stem for 10 seconds. Does it make a matter or you're going to give four or five shock and you're going to repeat it after a while? So after, the, after we finish the single run, we'll pull back and see, let him breathe in. And if we want to get more, put it back in. So you'll give 10, 10 shocks, the same? As in you know, the left main stem, because we are going to occlude the left main stem. Because I have a case like that, when I give in sex number seven, the patient collapsed. So sometimes I give four to five sh shock, waiting for a while, and going to another cycle. Every cycle, I give the patients uh, the, the coronary's time to breathe, and I don't know how, how long it's I, to make me comfortable with the blood pressure mm. uh, monitoring the, the circumstances around. But usually, usually when we do this 10 seconds, ten cycles. The, ten, the, the 10 seconds as in the shocks, it, it's uh, quite tolerated. Okay, thank you. You agree that we should check hemodynamics and the time of deflation should be at least a little bit longer than the time of inflation, depending on the patient LV function, everything, but it's a, yeah. I think it's a good rule, as we do for rota, that the resting time should be longer than the time of, uh, of yes. the yeah. yeah, I have one question. 
so uh, if a uh, disease started from the left main to led like that your case and the left main is 4.5 mm and led is 3.5 mm so what is the ideal size so i have the 3.5 if i do have 4 or shorter i would have done it but i have 3.5 uh, at that time that, that's a very oh, good question though how do you size the balloon and particularly if you've got a discordance between a bigger proximal vessel and a smaller distal vessel because the inflation pressures aren't very high you can use a slightly oversized balloon for the distal vessel so say the dis distal vessel is 3.5 your proximal vessel is 4 take a 4 and inflate it to 2 and deliver the therapy that way thank you yeah maybe yeah. last question please i think uh, we are suffering every day with using all the tools like you advise us uh, because the insurance is not convinced you have to use one tool only otherwise he will shift the patient to another doctor because yeah. you are too expensive the other point i don't know why the balloon is limited to the length of 12 is there any manufacturer limitation of that Thank yeah you. so it's down to the emitters so the emit there's two emitters in every shockwave balloon and they're positioned orthogonally so they go in 180 degree arc you can put more emitters in the balloon like for example the peripheral device has got four emitters but then the balloon becomes stiffer and less compliant and for the coronaries you know you you want something which is deliverable so it's a compromise between efficacy and deliverability and when uh, i would like to add one thing when you do the uh, the uh, the shorter balloon you may be more precise where is the shocks comes you have two sources the distal one is about 5 mm from the distal dots and the proximal one is 2 3 mm from the proximal dots so we just nail where is the eccentric uh plaque then you can focus the uh, uh the pulses i have a question yeah. for professor spratt uh i'm a technical one i i figure out what uh, Are there any precautions when using lithotripsy in patients with devices, pacemakers, uh, ICDs? Uh? Yeah, yeah, again, a good question. So there is a, a there is a, a mechanism in which the the shockwave balloon can capture electrically the ventricle. Now we we describe that first, and we called it shock topics. So um, there's a difference between electrical capture and mechanical capture. So you quite often see these spikes in a waveform, and that's electrical capture. Sometimes you can get electrical and mechanical capture, and that's associated with a sort of temporary depression in LV contractility because it's obviously like an ectopic; it's 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 doing a, a separate point. In terms of inhibition of pacemakers, that's been difficult to show, but it's a theoretical possibility. So it, you could, for some a pacemaker-dependent patient, you might want to be a little bit more aware of that. But remember. If you do capture the ventricle and it does inhibit pacing, it only happens for as long as you press the lithotripsy balloon. So the maximum length of time it can be is 10 seconds. That's a nice question, I think, to close the session. And uh, so we've seen that finally IVL is really today part of the arsenal to treat calcify lesion in uh, mo most of the cat lab. And uh, as we say, it's able to to treat the concentric, the eccentric, the deep, the superficial. So we just found a way to to modify probably a little bit of our practice and to see how we choose the good device for for each situation. But a, a summary was say that maybe if you are able to cross. It's fair to to try IVL first, and after to do imaging again. If you do imaging in your center, of course, and but uh, and and to keep probably a hysterectomy in the challenging situation where you can just not cross the the, the calcified lesion. So I would just close the session by thanking the 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 three speaker. We had very beautiful and challenging cases. Thank you for your for your participation. Thanks, Shockwave Medical, and wish you a nice day uh, in the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>